Well, good morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> as Lisa likes to say, uh, she likes to start things on time and end things on time. She's a she's a or teacher by trade, so I'm going to take her um, her guidance here for today. Lisa actually won't be joining us. Um, she is actually on a flight, but sends her regards to everyone. Uh, but nonetheless, we've got uh, Dr. Kagan with us, which we're really excited to kind of engage with him and ask him questions and kind of what's been top of mind. All of you have received a bio from um, from us uh, regarding his work, but just a kind of a, a quick uh, overview. You know, he's a senior fellow at ADI. He's a director of the Critical Threats Project. Fantastic work. Uh, you know, he's an author. Um, he spends a lot of his time researching on defense, national security issues, American military, Afghanistan, and also Iraq, uh, which hopefully we might be able to get into in parts of the conversation. Um, so. I'm going to speak less and give you the floor, um, Dr. Kagan, um, and just kind of share what's been top of mind for you. Maybe give us a kind of around the world assessment and your take on some of the, the top known and unknown threats posed to kind of American American security. Well, thank you, Victoria. Um, thanks for everyone who's joined. Thank you for your uh, support for AEI um, and for our, our common mission and objective. Um, so the Critical Threats Project at AEI is an open source intelligence organization uh, within AEI, uh, and we are partnered with the Institute for the Study of War, uh, which was uh, founded and is led by my wife, Kim Kagan. Um, and we function as a single open source analytical team um, with different areas of concentration. So at CTP, we have an Iran team which looks at Iranian internal dynamics and uh, strategy and Iranian activities in the region. And we also have a Salafi Jihadi team that is focusing on the continuing terror threat uh, to the US, in fact, growing terror threat to the US, uh, primarily in Africa, uh, the Middle East and South Asia. Um, ISW is world famous for the work that its Russia team has, has done on the Ukraine war uh, virtually all of the maps that you see uh, about that war at this point were generated by the ISW team. I oversee that team uh, because my background is in uh, Russian and Soviet military uh, studies. And so I have spent um, <laughs> almost every day since before the war began uh, working very, very closely with that team on uh, understanding what's going on in uh, the war in Ukraine and uh, trying to um, help guide America to uh, a sound policy to advance our interests and do the right thing there. Um, in addition to that, uh, the uh, ISW also has a, a Middle East team that works very closely with our Iran team and is looking at what's going on in Syria, which is extremely alarming, um, and is, uh, is forming a China team as well. Um, and that coheres with an effort that I'm working on with my colleague at AEI, Dan Blumenthal, on um, developing alternative strategies for coalition defense in Taiwan. So that is enough to keep me very busy. Um, and so uh, in principle, lots of things are top, in my, uh, top of mind because what I can tell you is in not one single uh, of those areas are things going other than very badly for the United States. Um, but the thing that's really top of mind for me, of course, is the, is the same thing that's likely top of mind for a lot of people, which is the fallout from the dumpster fire that has been uh, Washington, D.C. over the last few weeks, um, and which promises to continue for some time. Um, the decision uh, to strip out Ukraine aid um, from the continuing resolutions, and much more fundamentally than that, the full-throated assault that is being waged uh, by some portions, primarily of the right, against any further support for Ukraine, has brought us to actually a fundamental inflection point in world history. And I am not really, I'm not exaggerating. It's very hard to overstate what is at stake here. If the far right manages to block further aid to Ukraine, it is highly likely 
that the Russians will end up winning this war and that we will have allowed Putin to reverse the defeats and setbacks that the Ukrainians with our support have imposed on him, which will be devastatingly bad for us, for our interests in Ukraine, for our interests in Europe, for our interests vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but they will be even more devastating for another reason, which is that Xi Jinping is watching this war very closely and he has top of his mind the same question that Putin has had top of his mind throughout this conflict, which is, does the West actually have the staying power in a protracted struggle to fight for its own interests? In the case of Ukraine, fighting for our interests has been spending money. In the case of Taiwan, fighting for our interests will likely mean spending blood. If we as a country demonstrate that we are unwilling to continue spending money, most of which, by the way, is actually going to Americans and not simply being sent to Ukraine, we will not be able to persuade Xi that we will be willing to spend our blood to defend a country that we don't even recognize as an independent state. I can't, I can't overstate what the stakes are here. And the degree to which the conversation has shifted rapidly to this full-throated assault on aid for Ukraine is concealing the degree to which this is fundamentally an assault on the notion that America should work to advance its interests anywhere in the world, and that America should work to support its values and its allies and partners anywhere in the world. This is an isolationist program that suits all of the aggressors around the world and will invite them to further aggression. I can't overstate how important this moment is. And I also want to say it's not just about getting another aid bill through. Depending on exactly how the speaker fight shakes out, there will probably be another aid bill. That concerns me less than what narrative emerges from this fight. And if we have the narrative emerge that the United States should stop supporting Ukraine, but the majority is currently in, part of, in uh, Congress still supporting um, backing Ukraine managed through parliamentary maneuvers to get aid through, that will be a tactical victory and a strategic defeat. It has been a major failing of this administration, of many, that it has not articulated clearly to the American people the importance of supporting Ukraine and explained that this is not simply about doing altruistic things for Ukraine, but that this is actually opposing Russia, opposing Russian aggression, and taking the kind of stand here that should have been taken in 1938 against Hitler because the parallels, which are easily overdrawn, and I'm a historian, I've seen these parallels made constantly when they're not appropriate. Unfortunately here, they are. This administration has not made the case. And of course, for many understandable reasons, has, has virtually no credibility with a significant proportion of the American electorate. Republican leaders haven't made the case either, with a few out notable exceptions. This has to change. This has to change. We all collectively, everyone on every side, have to commit ourselves to helping the American people understand why it is a vital national security interest of the United States of America to oppose Russian aggression, to impose a defeat on Vladimir Putin, and to do what is necessary to demonstrate our will to resist aggression so that we can deter war with China so that we can deter war with Iran, which may also come to us, not at a moment of our choosing. We have to demonstrate our strength. There was a phenomenal op-ed uh, yesterday in the Wall Street Journal um, about, about their Heritage Foundation and the degree to which heritage has lost its moorings 
and rejected its values and turned its back on the Reagan view of the world that had been central to its stance for many decades. I'm very, I'm very pleased and proud to be at AEI, which has not lost, lost its moorings, which has remained true to its founding principles, and which has not allowed the vicissitudes of popularity of policies uh, to change who we are and what we stand for. Uh, but AEI is getting to be an army of one on this front. Um, and that imposes a greater uh, requirement on us to step up, which, uh, which we are trying with your help to do. So um, that's, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, for now, I'm happy to talk about any of the areas that I've mentioned to you. We can, I can spend days talking about Ukraine, but I'm also happy to talk about what's going on in the Middle East, uh, what, we're, what we're working on vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, or anything else that uh, is of concern to you. And if I don't know the answer, I'll just tell you that. Thank you for for that overview. Um, what a you know a great time and a bad time, bad and good time to live in this uh, world and kind of the importance that AI brings to this world. So um, thank you for highlighting for highlighting that. I I do want to kind of maybe stay a little bit on Ukraine and just to everybody um, who's here, uh, we'll take questions. If you want to type it into the chat. Feel free to raise your hand. Um, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you can do that as well, or you can text me your question. But just to kind of um, stay a little bit on Ukraine, um, I'd seen that you um, actually released your own article. I think it was um, yesterday, I believe, about kind of making the case on um, you know why Ukraine needs weapons and not debates over actually which ones. So instead of going maybe in the technicalities of which weapons those are, um, just if you can do in broad stroke and just kind of your take about what you wrote in that article um, and why it is that Ukraine does need weapons and which which ones specifically without the technicalities. You know, it's, this is, <laughs> my, my dad always used to love uh, to quote um, a famous Ohio State football coach, uh, who told his like to tell his players, let's not be too smart out there. Um, <laughs> we have a lot of in in DC. We have a lot of hyper sophisticated conversations about things um, that are actually not that complicated, and this this is one of them. Ukraine is fighting a mechanized maneuver war against a modern adversary that is also fighting a mechanized maneuver war. It needs all the capabilities that one needs to conduct a mechanized maneuver war. Simple. Um, I can list out very what those capabilities are. If you want to fight a mechanized maneuver war, that means you need armored vehicles. It means you need artillery. It means you need ammunition. It means you need aircraft. It means you need to have bombs to drop from the aircraft. It means you need to have air defense systems. It means in the modern world, you need to have long range uh, precision missiles. Uh, and, and it means a bunch of other things that I could list out down to small arms ammunition and rifles. Um, that's what you need to fight a mechanized maneuver war. Ukraine doesn't have a defense industry that's capable of producing what it needs. Ukraine depends upon the collective West to provide those capabilities. What I argued in the piece was simply that there, in truth, a lot of people are trying to drag you into conversations that are far more technical and sophisticated than is necessary. And we're getting into a lot of, or we had been before the most recent debacle, been getting into a lot of conversations about, well, the F-16 is not the optimal platform for Ukraine to use because blah, 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 and I can explain all the technical details to you. Um, to which my answer is, I got it. But the issue isn't that the F-16 is a perfect platform. The issue is that it's an airplane. And if you're gonna conduct mechanized maneuver warfare, you need airplanes. So for various reasons that are, that are sensible, uh, mainly because they are plentiful, uh, it was decided that we would give Ukraine F-16s. Fine. Um, the fact that it's not a perfect airplane or a magic weapon isn't interesting because the choice for Ukraine is not between magic weapon and some other weapon, it's between airplane and no airplane. And that dichotomy is the difference between is this a reasonable undertaking and it's not a reasonable undertaking. So that was the point that I was trying to make. And I went through a few different systems that people have been uh, focusing on.
Great. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Mr. Kosh, if you don't mind unmuting yourself, if you'd like to ask your question aloud. Uh, my question was, you, you saw that 60 Minutes uh, story the other, other week about uh, how money, the U.S. money going to Ukraine is being spent for all sorts of purposes other than fighting the war. How, how accurate do you think that uh, story is? And uh, what kind of uh, controls or, or monitoring do we have to make sure that the U.S. money is in fact really directed to helping the soldiers and, and buying ammunition and, and, uh, and winning the war? <sighs> Thank you so much for bringing this up because you're you're touching on a, a very important misconception that is the result of an of actual misrepresentation by a lot of people. The U.S. has not shoveled a hundred billion dollars of cash to Ukraine and told the Ukrainians to have at it. Uh, the majority of the military aid that we're giving to Ukraine is not in the form of cash at all. It's in the form of weapon systems, ammunition, and other materiel. Wouldn't do the Ukrainians any good if we handed them buckets of cash to buy things. We have to give them the equipment. So most of the military aid money, well over a majority of the military aid money that is being allocated, uh, that has been allocated in the U.S., isn't going to Ukraine at all. The money is going to American industry to replace the equipment that we're giving to the Ukrainians. There are a lot of benefits to that of that uh, approach to the US, including helping to energize what has been a moribund defense industrial base that is not ready to support a war with China or anyone else, uh, but that successive administrations have been unwilling to invest in. So a lot of this Ukraine aid that is presented as $40 billion of military aid to Ukraine is actually in the form of equipment with the money going to actually strengthen our defense industrial base, which actually makes it a twofer for us, not a loss. Now, of the military equipment that's going to Ukraine, it's going to the front. And the controls over where the equipment actually goes are um, staggeringly uh, rigid and aggressive and effective. And there have been no credible reports of military assistance, military equipment going, um, going astray and not going to the front line. Um, in terms of humanitarian aid and other forms of assistance and budgetary assistance, that's a you know that's a different story. Controls there can be more complicated. I I can't tell you that none of that uh, money has been misappropriated. There's corruption in Ukraine. Um, there's corruption in in almost any society. Honestly, you're I mean, <laughs> spent a decade working on Afghanistan. I spent 15, 18 months in Afghanistan. One of the things that Kim and I are proudest of is that we got the U.S. military, at least, to set up an anti-corruption task force in Afghanistan so that U.S. military dollars spent in Afghanistan would stop actively supporting the insurgency, which is one of the things that was going on. So I'm very alive to the issues of corruption, and I'm very familiar with, with what happens and how that works. Um, it You know, there is going to be some corruption. There is going to be some money misappropriated that happens in any society. It happens in every war. Um, it's funny, people are often much more willing to accept that there will be casualties in, in war in the form of people dying and getting wounded than they are to accept that there will be casualties in the form of money that gets misappropriated. In reality, in my judgment, when you are providing financial assistance to a country at war, you're going to have financial casualties. Uh, there are a lot of checks in place. There are a lot of systems that are uh, attempting to provide accountability, but they're never going to be perfect. Um, so in a certain sense, the, these these reports are, you know, like the old Casablanca line, you know, I'm shocked, shocked there's, there's gambling going on in this casino. Some money's going to be misappropriated. The majority of aid that's being provided to Ukraine is going where it needs to go. Uh, and there is a lot of data about that. Um, and the, of the military assistance we're providing, that is going to the Ukrainian military, and it, it is helping the Ukrainians kill Russians, defend their territory, um, and prevent Russia from uh, being the threat to us that Putin desires it to be. Maybe it would be helpful if you would do an op-ed to the Wall Street Journal uh, refuting some of that. Uh, 
uh, from uh, 60 Minutes, like like you just said. Thank you. Um, I, I will. We are working on that in various ways, and I will. Uh, we will continue efforts to to respond to that because um, it's important. The American people, have, of course, have a right to ask these questions and a right to these answers. So, thank you. Uh, we'll we will we'll see what we can do to get the word back out. Yeah, great idea. Uh, Mr. Smith, you're next. Uh, thank you. What what is the end result of the Ukrainian war? How do you how, how do you see it? finally um, um, concluding one way or the other. So <clears throat> either the Russians win or we win. Um, those are the those are the choices. Um, we've gotten out of the habit of thinking like that. Again, there, there are too many people with international relations degrees running around with a lot of hyper sophisticated ideas about how war works. Uh, but the truth is that the overwhelming majority of wars end with one side winning and the other side losing. By the way, the outcome is usually determined on the battlefield. This is this is another misapprehension that Americans have internalized, mainly from the Balkan experience, which we now want to apply to everything, where the desire seems to be to get some sort of stalemate, and then we get some, in this case, it'll need to be the ghost of Richard Holbrook and uh, lock all of the leaders in a room with him until uh, they come up with a Dayton Accord. Um, that that seems to be the model, honestly, that the administration or elements of the administration have been pursuing, um, and that a lot of people have in their minds. That's not the way most wars work. Most wars are decided on the battlefield. One side wins, the other side loses, and there's a piece that ratifies the, the military outcome. So what is the military outcome that is in America's interest? The military outcome that's in America's interest is Ukraine liberates its territory, and we help Ukraine establish a sufficiently powerful military to deter Russia from its inevitable desire to renew the conflict on terms of its choosing and avenge itself for a defeat. The Russian elite at this point, the Putinist regime, which means Putin and any of his, any successors of his ilk, will continue to pursue the objective that initiated this war as long as they think there's any chance of achieving it. And that objective is the subjugation of all of Ukraine. That is their aim. That's one of their aims. They have other aims Putin just laid out um, very articulately yesterday. Uh, in Russia, what his larger aims for the world are, which involve uh, things that are antithetical to American interests. But in Ukraine, his objective has been and always has, always will be the subjugation of Ukraine. He will not be satisfied with freezing the conflict on any particular lines. He's, he's been explicit about this repeatedly, and he just said it again yesterday. I'm not interested in minor territorial acquisitions. So we need to, first of all, internalize what the Russian objectives actually are. And the objectives are the subjugation of Ukraine. So what will happen if the front is frozen along current lines? Well, we've actually seen this movie before. That's what happened after 2014. Uh, the Ukrainians had a revolution to overthrow a pro-Russian dictator um, and brought in a government that was not pro-Russian. Putin decided that that was unacceptable. And so he invaded Ukraine first with proxies. Remember the little the little green men who were actually Russian uh, special forces uh, personnel out of uniform um, who took over Crimea. And then his proxies in Eastern Ukraine who started uh, trying to take over a big part of Ukraine and failed. And then he sent the Russian military in. At a certain point, he made a bunch of gains, but then it became clear to him he wasn't gonna be able to get what he wanted. And so he allowed the conflict to be frozen with an agreement that was called the Minsk II Accords. And the West thought, okay, cool. I mean, it's bad, it's, you know, it's sad and bad that the Russians have Crimea and they've taken hunks of the East, but at least we've got this under control. Now we've got a diplomatic process and so forth. Putin was unsatisfied with that diplomatic process, even though he'd imposed it to his liking. And so he continued his efforts to subjugate Ukraine politically using the territories that he'd taken under Minsk II uh, and that the West had effectively recognized um, without formally recognizing that he'd taken them as his. And he used those as levers to try to drive Ukrainian politics in a way that would have given him control of Kyiv through those means. By 2020, 2021, he'd concluded that that effort had failed and that he was not going to be able to gain control of Ukraine through those means. He'd also concluded that America wasn't going to do anything to stop him because he was watching what we were doing in, Af in Afghanistan. And he was watching the Biden withdrawal from Afghanistan. 
and he was listening to Biden say, well, we're not going to fight for Ukraine, but we want to talk. And he listened to us make a variety of offers, to try to give him off ramps. And that's, that's why he invaded. Because he was dissatisfied with the partial victory that he'd had. And he believed that we would not stand up to him and resist him. And we were giving him a lot of evidence to think that, that was true. That pattern will repeat itself if we allow the conflict to be frozen along lines that give Russia an advantageous position from which to launch a future attack. So the war could end, this war could end that way for now. But if it ends that way for now, there will be another war in a few years that Putin or his successor will initiate on much more advantageous terms. And against a West that I suspect will be even less prepared than it is now to stand up to him. So I can't tell you what the outcome will be because a lot of it rests on us. And we are too much in the, in the mindset of, you know, well, sort of what will be will be, and I don't know what can happen, and, and gee, and I don't know if the Ukrainians can do this. And it's a little bit like, um, you know, what my, my friend and first office mate at West Point, H.R. McMaster, calls the uh, Marlon Perkins fallacy for any of the old Mutual, mutual of Omaha Wild Kingdom show, um, where, I don't know if you guys remember that, but, you know, the, the, the key thing was Marlon Perkins' son, Jim, was, was always out there with the animals. Uh, and he was he was out there wrangling wrangling with the lions and the tigers for the for the benefit of the audience, and you know basically that's the way we look at our partners who fight our wars, and we we look at them like Jim. We say, hey, get in there, Jim, you know, and then we say, oh my God, oh look, uh, I think the lion might be going to get in Jim. Run, Jim. That's kind of that's kind of the mindset that we're sort of having here. But the truth is, we have agency over this. Because if we provide Ukraine with the equipment that it needs, Ukrainians can defeat the Russian military in Ukraine. Ukrainians can achieve the objective that we need them to achieve. If we don't provide that equipment, they can't. And I think we need to internalize what our own agency here is in determining the outcome. So I can't tell you how it ends. I can tell you how it should end. I can tell you how it can end. But how it actually does end depends pretty heavily on us. Well, one follow-up question on that. Does Ukraine have enough uh, 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 military men and women to fight this war for a number of years? They do. Um, <clears throat> it would be a lot easier for them if they were confident that they were going to have the equipment and the material support that they need to do that. But Ukraine is at full national mobilization and Russia isn't. Um, Russia has, in principle, a three-to-one population advantage over Ukraine. Um, Putin is extremely reluctant to go to full national mobilization, and there are constraints on his ability to do so anyway, at least in the short term. Over the long term, you know, it's a different story. On the other hand, population is rarely dispositive in the outcome of wars. Uh, if population ratios determine the outcome of wars, Israel would have ceased to exist a long time ago. Um, so the, you know, the Ukraine, Ukraine can be, uh, a lesser Israel on a larger scale and is in many respects because the power that Ukraine has shown has been an adaptiveness and innovation, a creativity and ways of finding solutions to problems that an autocratic Russian state is really not uh, able to do. So I, I am confident that Ukraine can offset the uh, overall population disparity if we uh, provide it with the access to the equipment and material and support that it needs to fuel its innovative and determined population. Will they, will they continue to fight? So the Russian project is a genocidal war of aggression. The, and I, I, use the term, I use the word advisedly. I'm one of those who's been very hostile to the um, devaluation of the word genocide and the uh, application of it to many cases where it's not appropriate. It's appropriate here. The explicit Russian project is the elimination of the Ukrainian state and the denial and destruction of the Ukrainian people um, and their resubordination from Putin's perspective to Russia. The funny thing about being on the receiving end of a genocidal war of aggression is your motivation to resist that is pretty high. Uh, and that's what I'm seeing. That's what I saw when I was there and when I was in Ukraine about a month ago. They're badly demoralized and I'm sure they're much more demoralized now. But the will to fight isn't broken. Uh, whereas the Russians are waging a war of aggression. 
Now, you know, Putin may be able to keep his, his people behind him indefinitely, but at the end of the day, the Russians are waging a war of aggression uh, in a circumstance in which they're not actually threatened. The balance of motivation is on Ukraine's side. So yes, I think the Ukrainians can stand support this, this if we will support them. Thank you. Great questions. Uh, Mr. Nana, would you like to ask your question or expand on the question that you have in the chat? Yes. Uh, thank you. Your comments about this being a moment of inflection are very sobering. Um, comment, if you would, on the status of our uh, industrial mun munitions. You read a lot about uh, our supplies are getting emptied. And if uh, something happened to Taiwan next week, we'd really be in trouble because we wouldn't have enough uh, to handle that kind of stuff. And in a secondary part of this question would be, what's your sense of how likely um, Russia might employ nuclear weapons? Our defense industrial base has been a travesty for decades, uh, ever since we, we started cashing in uh, Cold War peace dividends, uh, like they were grandma's birthday money. And, you know, we, we had multiple peace dividends long beyond the point when it actually made any sense. And we deliberately hollowed out our defense industrial base. Um, and we deliberately fostered, because I remember this going on in the 1990s, and I was screaming about it then, um, because I could see where it was going to lead. Um, we've done nothing to reverse that. So, <clears throat> as many people more articulate about this than I have argued, the reason our defense industrial base is unprepared is not because of Ukraine, because of decisions that, have, that we've made for decades. We would not have had the stocks that we need to fight a war with China even if we were not giving anything to Ukraine. Our stocks are too low. Our military industrial base is too small. Uh, this was an opportunity and is an opportunity to mobilize it. It's an opportunity to re-equip our forces, uh, which is going on, but it's going on much more slowly than it should have. The administration should have put the defense industrial base on a mobilization footing in April, 2022. It didn't. Uh, that needs to happen now. So concretely, this is another choice we're making. We we are having this problem because we are choosing to have this problem. And we're choosing to have this problem because we're simply not recognizing how fundamental is the inflection that we're looking at here and how serious we need to get about an incredibly dangerous world. We've been coasting on the post-Cold War order for 30 years, but it's over. We're in a new era of history, and it's an era that's much more challenging for us. And the post-Cold War defense industrial base that we're still relying on, which wasn't changed or affected all that much by 9-11 wars, by the way, um, is inadequate. And this is a wake-up call. We've had wake-up calls like this before. So one of the things that sparked what became the Reagan uh, defense buildup was the 1973 Arab-Israeli War. And there are lots of fascinating studies about this because the, in, as the American military uh, leaders and defense industrial leaders watched that war, um, what they saw was a shocking and terrifying rate of expenditure of equipment of all varieties. And they did the math and they realized we couldn't sustain that in a modern conflict. And so we started after 1973 we started figuring out what was going to be required in modern war and that became the basis of the reagan defense buildup this war is doing the same thing for us this is a wake-up call for us say okay this is what modern war is going to look like can we fight and sustain our forces at this rate of equipment and artillery and ammunition expenditure no okay well what are we going to do about that so in the first instance we're not reacting even to the lesson that is in front of us about what modern war demands. Now, specifically, are we compromising our ability to defend Taiwan by aiding Ukraine? Not in any meaningful sense. Taiwan, the, our military defense of Taiwan is first and foremost an air naval activity. Our, our primary mission in defending Taiwan is preventing the Chinese from getting an invasion fleet across the Taiwan Strait. The systems we're going to use to do that are going to be aircraft, ships, submarines, and the munitions that they fire. Well, we're not giving any naval stuff to Ukraine, obviously. 
uh, the planes that matter are not F-16s, but are F-35s, F-22s, B-2s. We're not giving the Ukrainians any of those. And they're the long-range standoff munitions that those aircraft fire, which we're also not giving the Ukrainians. In certain very limited categories of weapons that would be dual use in certain situations in Taiwan, we're running low. But what I'm going to tell you is that if we're down to the level of worrying about how many HIMARS or ATACMs we have to defend Taiwan, we're in big trouble because that means that we're worrying about the Chinese actually getting ashore, which means that we will have failed in the first and foremost and primary task and mission and theory of the case of how we're going to defeat the Chinese invasion, which is using a whole bunch of things that we're absolutely not giving the Ukrainians. So no, the Ukraine war is not compromising our ability to defend Taiwan at this point. Um, it is providing us a wake-up call, and we're, not re and we're not responding. We're not waking up. We're still snoozing, and that's what, that alarms me. Putin's use of nuclear weapons. Um, Putin is not going to use nuclear weapons against us. We're, we are not going to get into a nuclear war with Putin. Um, Putin is not an apocalyptic thinker. One of the differences between Putin and Hitler is that Hitler was an apocalyptic thinker, and he's the guy who was willing to go down in his bunker and shoot himself uh, and just to have, have his entire country destroyed uh, in pursuit of his apocalyptic division. Putin is a this worldly leader who wants to win here. And he's also, I could I give you his, you know, what we know about the, the long distance um, sort of psychiatric study that one can make of Putin from his own words and his own writings and autobiographies that he's written and things. Um, Putin is, a, is, is all about judo. And that means that Putin's worldview is he can get thrown, but he'll always come back. Uh, that's not a worldview that is conducive to, oh my God, I'm going to be defeated and better end the world. So Putin's not going to get into a nuclear war with us. Uh, might he use tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine? Sure. That risk has been there since the moment that Ukraine began militarily, militarily to resist the invasion by a neighbor armed with nuclear weapons. Um, what how do we deal with that? Well, the administration's position is we dasn't do anything that might trigger Putin to use tactical nuclear weapons because it would be catastrophic to set the precedent that tactical nuclear weapons would be used. Okay, that's one way of looking at it. That would be a disaster. But I'm concerned about a different disaster. And the disaster I'm concerned about is we're sending a very loud message to every dictator around the world, every aggressor around the world. If you threaten to use tactical nuclear weapons, the United States will surrender. That's a problem because Xi Jinping has a lot of nuclear weapons and he's taking notes on this. And the fact that we're prepared to be self-deterred lest we somehow quote, trigger Putin to using tactical nuclear weapons is extremely alarming. The Iranians are also taking notes on this. And I guarantee you the lesson that they're learning is, yeah, you know, this nuclear program we have, we really ought to pursue it. Um, so we've got the, I think we've got the, the wrong end of the stick here. What we need to demonstrate is that we will not be deterred by the threat of the use of tactical nuclear weapons. And on the contrary, we need to deter the use of nuclear weapons. But administration has clearly been working on that privately. It's been working on that some publicly. I think the odds that Putin will use tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine, even if he's losing badly, are low, but not zero. But what we need to be doing is focusing on deterring that use rather than deterring ourselves for fear of that use. As a quick follow-up, explain tactical or nuclear uh, uh, as opposed to nuclear. Yeah, so I, it's I, it's a it's a not a great term, and I apologize. Fundamentally, it, the the question is how large is the weapon and how long is the range. Um, I the, what we're talking about what Putin would use in Ukraine would likely be relatively small nuclear weapons that would be used to achieve, in general terms, battlefield effects. I don't see him nuking Kiev or Kharkiv or a Ukrainian city. Uh, there are scenarios in which it could ad advantage the Russian military to use small yield nuclear weapons. Um, many of them though, what's hard to see is a scenario in which he uses one or two and gets any meaningful benefit other than psychological. But militarily, there are ways in which he could use uh, small low yield nuclear weapons on the battlefield to achieve some battlefield successes. Um, I think I think those scenarios are not that likely to arise. And I think that he's unlikely to use the, those low yield nuclear weapons in those scenarios. But I'm distinguishing between low yield nuclear weapons used by Russia in Ukraine from much larger, higher yield nuclear weapons used by Russia at longer range against targets in the West.
Um, so we've got five minutes um, left on our clock. So I'm going to go to Mr. Roeder if you'd like to ask your question aloud. Fred, I, I uh, appreciate your being with us this morning. Uh, my question is, what, where do you see support really in this administration? It's been very slow on the uptake, and obviously Biden has now said he's going to say something about this finally. Um, but where is the, where in this administration is the most important support for Ukraine? Um, <clears throat> I think the State Department has actually been the strongest on this. I think Tony Blinken actually really is uh, a strong voice uh, for support. Um, full disclosure, my sister-in-law is Victoria Newland, um, who is acting as Deputy Secretary of State. And it is known uh, publicly uh, that she is a very strong supporter of Ukraine. Um, I'm not gonna say anything more about that, um, but uh, you can look up her record on this and that's, that'll, that'll stand. Uh, but Blinken has been, I think, uh, an articulate advocate inside and outside the administration uh, for this. I think there are a lot of people in the American military who understand how important this is. I think I'll speak very candidly to you that de the recently departed uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs uh, was a huge problem. Um, and I think that the change in that job will probably be good uh, because I think that uh, General Milley uh, got outside of his remit in the kind of advice that he was providing um, and uh, just had a wrong view on this. Um, General Cavoli, the U.S. Uh, Army Europe or U.S. Uh, European Command commander, uh, understands how important this fight is. Uh, we've had some issues there in terms of exactly what equipment he's willing to give up from his own stockpiles and a few other things, but uh, he's been a strong supporter of this. There's a lot of support in the American military for this. Um, and I think with General Milley uh, retired, we, you know, we may see some more of that. I think uh, Secretary Austin is generally uh, in the right place. Um, I think he's, you know, he's the kind of person who's never going to be very far away from where his boss is. So if the president is not strong, you know, he'll trim some. But I think that Secretary Austin is, is generally in the right place on this. Um, but the key question is always the president. And I think the president is determined not to let Ukraine lose. Uh, I think he has probably too narrow a definition of what lose means. Um, but I think the critique that Republicans should be making, if they could harness the actual principles and legacy of the Republican Party and the Reagan Republican Party particularly, the critique they should be making is what Biden is not committing to is help Ukraine win. And that is a fair critique, and that is a problem. And I think that that's Biden. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll see where we get to from here. Um, hopefully the advice that's coming out of the Joint Chiefs will be better. Uh, there's some good people who've taken over there, uh, also in the positions of the service chiefs. So hopefully that advice will be better. But, um, you know, look, the Biden administration has not been seriously challenged on this issue for a long time. Now they're being challenged. See what the president says, um, and we'll see where they get to. But I think I'm just heart sick at what at, at what's become of the Republican Party. I know a lot of people are. I mean, that's every, probably everybody agrees about that. But I'm particularly heart sick about the full throated assault on Reagan values and the Reagan view of what the United States can and should be. And again, if you if you haven't read the op-ed yesterday about heritage, it's, it's you know it was. Since heritage has been so bad on this, it was a pleasure to me to see someone take them down. But the, the op-ed also really harnessed brilliantly what the Reagan view had been and reminded me of how important was the clarity of vision that Reagan had. And that vision was that the United States can be strong at home and abroad. That the United States has a mission to be strong abroad, and that is our interest to do that. And that whatever our internal problems, and it's so funny because in the modern era, we've decided that the 80s were, uh, you know, total harmony and delight and no serious domestic problems, right? <laughs> I mean, you lived through that. That's not what it felt like at the time. Um, and that wasn't what it was like at the time. Reagan read, led us through a period of great division and tension. Um, and he did that 
healing wounds and strengthening us at home while also winning the Cold War. And the op-ed uh, yesterday um, reminded us we can do that and we could do it now. And I think we need really to harness that legacy once more and press in the first instance on Republicans and then the second instance on the administration to remember what America actually is and what America must be. We can be home, we can be strong at home, we can address our domestic problems, which are real, and we can be the leader of the world. Because if we don't lead the world, who will? And that right now, the answer to that question is Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping, and the IRGC. That's a bad world. That's a world that Reagan would never have accepted. It's a world that the Republican Party of Reagan would never have accepted. And it's a world we don't have to accept. So I call on all of you to do everything you can to press anyone that you know who is influential in politics, to remember what America is, what America was, and what America must be. Amen to that. Double amens to that. Thank you. Thank you for just your comments, your analysis. Um, as someone had said earlier, very sobering um, at the inflection point that we're at. So um, I'm grateful for your time. I'm grateful for um, just your expertise and in, in sharing your insights with us. Um, I know we had a number of questions that we couldn't get to today, and I apologize for that. And um, hopefully we'll be able to address it in other ways with other scholars in the future. But uh, Dr. Kagan, just want to thank you for your time and sharing that with us. And to everyone on the call, thank you for also being a part of this. We look forward to engaging you in other upcoming Coffee and Conversations. We'll send a calendar um, over to everybody. But I hope everyone has a lovely Friday and look forward to staying engaged um, at the next times. Thank you all. Thank you.